Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've been talking to you an awful lot this morning, but now you have an opportunity to talk to us. One way is through this Twitter wall. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Twitter, but here it is. You'll see that people are regularly posting things. The magic of this is that some of the Twitters appear on this. I've just been handed some questions, and the panelists who are coming next are going to get asked these questions. So a really good way of asking the questions if you don't feel like putting your hand up, put it on the tweet wall, it'll go through to our team at the back, they will write them down and feed them to me, and then we can ask the panelists to answer your questions. But another way is actually to put your hand up. Now, I'm just looking to the back of the room. The Destry hosts and hostesses, Elizabeth, do you manage to find the Destry host? Right, we have one gentleman here. There'll be others coming. You will notice that he is holding a microphone in his hand. He is going to be situated with his colleagues in various strategic parts of the room. And as we go through the next session, I'm going to regularly break and come to you to say, did you agree with what the panelists just said? What do you think? Do you have another question? And even if I don't see any hands up, I'm still going to come into the audience and stick the microphone next to some unsuspecting person who will then have to ask a question. And I've got a number of you already visualized, so I know you know where I'm coming if there are no questions. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, it's now my great pleasure to invite three further people to join us on stage. Could I invite Dr. Detlef Eckhardt, Peter Thiele, and Pierre Maris onto stage, please, would you like to come up? So who are all these people on stage? Well, Dr. Detlef Eckhardt works for the European Commission in the Directorate General for Employment and Social Affairs and Inclusion and is a Director for Europe 2020 and Employment Policies. Welcome. Uh, Peter Thiele, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yep, perfect. Thiele, perfect. yeah? Alles klar. Good is the vice chair of the ESCO board. So he's sitting next to the chair of the ESCO board and here we have the vice chair. So if you really don't like the ESCO product, these are the two people to ask now because they're right here. In addition to being the vice chair, he works for the Federal Ministry of Education and Research in Germany as the deputy director for VET, vocational education and training and sits on probably far too many EU service committees than he would like, as well as every now and then traveling down to Geneva for the ILO, the International Labour Organization. Um, Pierre Marais, bonjour, uh, also works for the European Commission in the Directorate General for Education and Culture, and he is Director of Europe 2020, which must be a, a challenging task. You have a slightly longer countdown until we get to 2020, but uh, <laughs> it's coming up. So as I said, this is, an op this is a panel. I have a number of questions that I will be posing to the panel, but literally at any moment, <laughs> stick your hand up if you have a question. Okay. Dear panelists, welcome. I thought we could start with uh, a slightly controversial question, if that's okay for you. When looking at the current reality in Europe, some member states are facing youth unemployment rates of over 50%. I was talking to our colleague from Greece in the purple tie over there this morning, and he's working on this problem. And he says, youth unemployment, I'm sorry, it's just far too high. We have too many people unemployed. 
And what are we doing? Well, we're all sitting here in Brussels talking about a classification system. How is that going to help? How will ESCO help us deal with that situation? Would any of you care to pick up that question? There is a microphone on the table. Be brave. I think I, I, yeah, it works, yeah, it's working. Um, I think I can uh, at least try to answer uh, some of the implications uh, involved in, the, in this question. Uh, first of all, in the end of the day, uh, what helps people are a series of measures, small and bigger ones. Not a single answer, but there are many answers. And ESCO is one of, uh, of, the, uh, of youth unemployment um, has many reasons. One is structural, because there's uh, always a problem with uh, youth unemployment in all countries. It tends to be higher unemployment rates for, for young people than the average rate for a couple of reasons. Um, then we have the, uh, the crisis which hits some member states particularly and therefore uh, we are looking for special answers and as you probably know the European Union has provided many answers uh, whether this will find uh, whether this will solve the problems to a satisfactory degree we will see over the next two years I just want to mention two measures that we have taken one measure is to uh, 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 increase the budget available for uh, the ESF, uh, 3 billion specially allocated uh, for young uh, unemployed people, plus 3 billion uh, from the ESF. This doesn't prevent member states to invest even more, and we are encouraging member states to invest even more. And this will be this, uh, six, these 6 billion will be spent over the next two years, so it's a kind of front loading and uh, it will start uh, in 2014. The second measure is the youth guarantee, uh, which needs a lot of explanation because it is not a guarantee to solve the problem, but it's a guarantee that young people get an offer. And an offer is more than just a vacancy offer, saying here you have a vacancy, go and good luck. So it really means working with young people to, to find a, a good offer. And uh, a part of the discussion is also related to how to find for young people a better matching on the job market. And here ESCO is an answer not only for young people but also for young people. And so the better functioning of the labour market which will help uh, young people uh, not only to find a job in their own country but potentially also in other countries. Uh, and here ESCO will uh, provide an answer. Very good. So we have it job matching. Pierre, would you like to say something on this? How are we going to deal with unemployment? How is ESCO going to help us? Yes, well, one big uh, message of the European Union regarding uh, the, the strategy for growth and jobs Europe 2020 concerning education is a change of priorities. Uh, and it's quite important because in the education field the, the tradition is, okay, education is for transfer of knowledge is for personal development, it's for citizenship development. It's true, it's, true, it's still there. But the key message at the European level now is the, the priority of priority at the time being with the crisis is skills for jobs. Uh, and that's, uh, it's good to, to have this kind of message at the European level because I think everybody would agree here, yeah, but when we discuss with uh, institutions in the European, uh, in, in, uh, in member states about education, it's not so obvious to convince millions of teachers, millions of professors on the importance of skills for jobs in their priority. As mentioned by Detlef, it's a set of uh, measures and uh, he mentioned already uh, a number of them. I, I would like just to, to add, uh, for example, the Alliance for Apprenticeship, which is really linked to, to that, the, the business university cooperation, which is another way to link uh, the world of education and the, and the labor market. Uh, the, the panorama for forecasting what, the, what will be the future, very difficult, but we cooperate with DG Employment on that. And obviously, ESCO, ESCO which is uh, starting uh, today, which is uh, the, the vocabulary, the, the dialogue between the education world and, and, uh, and uh, the labor market. And, uh, 
obviously it's a, it's a long-term project. Uh, the, the effect on youth unemployment, on the, the matching between uh, skills and uh, uh, needs of the labor market uh, will, will take some time. So I see the urgency. Um, we cannot solve the problem in six months, even if we have a kind of front-loading measures. Uh, but we have also to work on the, on the medium term, what we try to do. Thank you very much. Uh, what does this situation look like in Germany? Maybe the, the unemployment is less key, but the whole issue of finding the right people with the right qualifications and skills, uh, there are lots of areas where you're desperately looking for people in the IT sector, in other words, but you can't find them. How is ESCO going to help you in this situation? Um, I just can add some points that were already mentioned by my colleagues from the European uh, Commission. Uh, I, as concerned the European level, then I turn to the uh, German uh, reality. Uh, I think on the European level, uh, if I take the example of the European Alliance for Apprenticeship, uh, this initiative makes very clear that we try via this initiative to combine and to bridge the world of education and the world of labour, meaning that the requirements of the labour market are really to be reflected in the education system. And I think ESCO, with its taxonomy, with its standard terminology in Europe, can be very helpful in this process in order to allow educational institutions to adapt to the re labor market requirements on a European standardized terminology and taxonomy. And I think that's an important midterm uh, plus of, uh, of ESCO. Uh, secondly, we face the youth unemployment of, I think, in the meantime, 25% in, in, in Europe, in average. Um, a lot of these people are very well qualified. In Greece, for example, a lot of, a lot of young people who have university degrees, but the, but the qualifications they receive in the education system don't match with the requirements of the labor markets, taking into account that it's anyhow a low labor market at the, uh, for the time being in some countries. So ESCO can really help to also uh, readdress the priorities in the education system on what is necessary in the labor market in order to improve also the employability of these workers. And last point, on the European scale, what I think is an effort, an, as, an asset for, uh, for ESCO is uh, that we have 80 million low or non-qualified Europeans in Europe. Um, ESCO, and that's the opposite to the European Qualification Framework, allows for a taxonomy of validation of non-formal and informal uh, training and uh, uh, qualification learning uh, because we have skills and competence packages. You don't need the whole qualification in order to get a kind of European add-on. You can mirror your uh, non-formal, informal learning via the skills and competence packages that are uh, mentioned in Pillar 2 of the, in the ESCO. So that helps people to show at least part qualifications in order to have easier access to the labor market. As concerns the situation in Germany, we are at the moment, we were the sick man in Europe 10 years ago, uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, we turn to have a fantastic labor market for the time being with a very low youth unemployment below 8%. So what we are really lacking is skilled workforce in the meantime. And uh, I know this is not very diplomatic, but um, we have a European labor market and we want to revive this labor market. We only have a mobility of 2 to 3% on the European labor market. If the situation is as it is that in some countries you have unemployment rates of beyond 60%, in others you have a lack of skilled workforce, why not really improve mobility, why not really also send young people for training, for example, and for work to those countries uh, that have employment and give them their freedom to decide whether they go back or not. And there's a big potential uh, that could also be helped by the taxonomy of ESCO to find the right, uh, um, uh, how to say, to match to the right matching of qualifications and um, uh, job uh, requirements. Uh, why not uh, use ESCO as a tool also to improve this mobility? Very good. Well, I think mobility is a key issue that will be coming up in a minute. Let me just turn very quickly to the audience because these gentlemen up here on the platform very comfortably sitting there saying, yes, of course ESCO can help, but what does it actually look like in reality? And I'm afraid you shouldn't have talked to me this morning because I'm going to come to you. If you could please stand up. Now, you're in Greece and you're working in a training school. What do you need ESCO to do for you? Um. My opinion is uh, it's the opposite uh, question. Uh, when I will back, 
when I, I'm going to be back in Greece and I will face uh, my students because I'm the director of an apprenticeship school, I want to have an answer to them what ESCO is going to help them to find a job or to match at enterprises searching for employers. And could I, want, uh, I think that uh, I, I have to have a clear uh, answer because the problem in Greece is 65% of unemployment uh, under 25 uh, years old students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jeremy, your thoughts on that? He goes back to Greece, he's at the technical school, the students say, we have learnt and skills and qualifications, how can ESCO help us? Thank you. Well, um, I think the first thing that we would all um, acknowledge is that the, uh, the, the issues and the difficulties that your students face are very real and, and very practical. Um, I would, again, just reiterate the point that Detlef made, that there is a... This is, ESCO is really to be seen as part of a package uh, of measures. I don't actually see um, ESCO as some kind of luxury or academic exercise, um, but fitting along with a labour market across Europe um, that you know, will gradually move and there will be uh, increases in opportunities and mobility. This is part of the preparation that your students um, and my job seekers need to undertake together. And um, you know, if you look back in uh, history, um, certainly in the United Kingdom, our experience has been um, that um, uh, almost whenever we've introduced a new uh, scheme or system or developed um, a new way of doing things, the question has always been asked, well, um, is this the right time to introduce uh, a change? Um, well, my response tends to be, um, if not now, when? Um, and if the European labour market um, has any hope of really functioning in a systematic, um, efficient, more confident manner, then it does seem to me that providing people with the tools to interact, uh, providing employers, and at a very practical level, because I'm always I'm, I'm concerned with how this works out in practice in the operation, um, people who need, who have uh, job opportunities to offer, there needs to be a consistent way of defining the kind of skills that they require uh, to source. So it does seem to me that um, you know, the, the position that you're experiencing, I think um, you, you're not alone in that. I think um, they are serious issues. Uh, but I think that uh, ESCO provides one building block uh, to provide some of the solutions. Thank you very much. Um, we have a tweet, and this is from ePortfolio Netherlands, if I've got that right. And it says, and it builds on what you've just been talking about, Jeremy, will ESCO EU build the bridges between actors in education and in labour markets. The person who sent that tweet, maybe they're not in the room. That's from external. Okay, so we have, you see, we're really in contact with Europe here. So we have somebody who's not even in this conference but needs to know an answer to that. Is ESCO EU going to build the bridges between actors in education and labour market? Who would like to answer that? question we'll have a go at that. Probably, probably Pierre will, uh, will, uh, will complement uh, what I, I'm going to say. Uh, the, uh, this is one of the purposes of ESCO and if ESCO is successful it will. 
Um, and why is it so important <coughs> to have this bridge? I mean, first of all, we were just talking about young people, and the problem of young people, I, I mentioned it's a structural problem, um, is to get the first uh, step into the, uh, into the labor market. And therefore, showing the competences in a different way than just saying, uh, well, I have a university degree or I have a, an occupation, uh, is no longer enough to attract uh, employers to hire uh, a young, young person. And the way uh, the, the, uh, the employers are, uh, are now looking for um, their staff is different than 20 years ago. 20 years or 10 years ago, um, the main question was, okay, you are um, able to, you're a welder or uh, you're an architect or you're a software engineer, etc. So it's enough that you show that you have an, an academic degree and you have a profession uh, either or. And, but today it is much more because there are a lot of uh, grey areas where competences fall between uh, those uh, uh, strict uh, ca uh, categories. And therefore uh, a kind of deep, uh, deeper classification schemes and more labor market intelligence which is reflected in is highly needed in order to actually help this transition between schools and, and work and also uh, later on in the job matching within the country. So it's not only about labor mobility but also in particular between countries where all the multilingual support of ESCO will be of great help. Pierre, maybe you want to add? Yes, just, just to say that, uh, yes, the answer is yes. One of the main purposes of uh, ESCO is really to create this uh, dialogue and this common understanding between the two, the two worlds, I would say. And for me, the, the, the real innovation in ESCO is not really on occupation, because it's already, okay, we have to improve, to standardize, to have a common uh, taxonomy. It's not really on qualifications, because we have also a, a, a process for, for defining qualifications in all member states and to have a link with, with the European level. The real innovation is a skills and competencies area in which we are jointly defining what does it mean for the labor market needs, what does it mean for education systems. And uh, it's really, I was impressed by the number of cross-sectorial or job-specific uh, skills and competencies already defined, acquired through the formal qualification process or acquired through the non-formal process as mentioned by, by Peter. And uh, just uh, w one more comment, if you take the, re the last results of the PIAC survey from OECD which has been managed also with, with the European Commission, you see a big discrepancy between qualifications and real skills and competencies. And we have to reflect upon that and ESCO will be very useful for that. Very good, I'll come in a minute. Um, but I need to come to the audience on this because uh, personally, uh, my first university degree was in theology. And that has not really equipped me to, uh, it's not really given me the skills that I needed for the labor market. But sir, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, my name is Stefan Skimotis, coming from Sweden. I work in, as an NCP of European Qualification Framework. I have a reflection. I've been working within European working groups since the beginning of 2000 in ECVET, in EQF, in uh, it's becoming ECAVET. And now I'm here in ESCO. And I want to hear your distinguished people sitting up there. If I come back home to Sweden and I will talk, now we will have introduced another tool starting with the E. So how, I mean, we are still working on the European Qualification Framework and as, as I heard you say, all the distinguished men up there, we are working with the same issue. We want to have a bridge between the working, working life and the education system. And you are saying the same thing. I'm not saying ESCO is a bad thing, but I want to have your comment and thinking about that we introducing new European tools in European countries while we're still working with tools that still are on developing. Thank you. 
Very good question. Thank you. So how are we going to deal with this? Yet another European tool alongside all the other ones. Did you want to say something on this? And then I think also gentlemen here might say, oh, please. Uh, it's, uh, okay, if you don't mind. Probably would uh, in the first end go to the Commission this question, but um, uh, I think in this case, ESCO, there's a good synergy with the existing um, e-instruments you mentioned. Uh, take the EQF that you represented in your group. This is the pillar three of ESCO. So it's not a kind of competition among instruments. It's building synergies between instruments. Uh, in the end, and that was not so much mentioned or not so detailed mentioned this morning, the pillar three that you see as qualification pillar is just at the, for the time being the EQF and the EQF portal, meaning all the skills, competences and the occupations should be mirrored towards the qualifications via the EQF portal. Um, meaning this is an integral approach, it's not a kind of new element, it's just a, a new instrument, it's, it's a combination of the existing instruments. Nevertheless, I really have to say here as well, as educationalist, ESCO has the potential to bridge education and labor. It has a lot of advantages uh, that I could imagine, also in the field of education. You could use, use the ESCO taxonomy, for example, also for competence measurement in, in, vo in vocational training and education. We all talked about PISA, about PIAC. For the t at the moment, we are working with the OECD on a VET PISA, and we need a matrix, a common matrix, international matrix for occupational standards. Now we have ESCO, so we could find synergy effects there, one point. Another one, if we really think through that model, qualifications mirrored by skills and competence packages and these packages against, again mirrored towards qualifications we will at the end of the day probably find out that in many occupations aviation industry, automotive industry, chemistry there are 60-70% similarities between the 10,000 of qualifications in our countries meaning we have a de facto harmonization of qualifications to a strong part Nobody talks about that for the time being in that model, but would be, that would be a big asset to find out in this, um, in this um, uh, instrument that we have de facto European qualification standards already available. Nobody knew it, but we found out via this instrument. And everybody knows formally in the European cooperation there is, it's forbidden to harmonize, but via this de facto um, comparison one could find this kind of de facto harmonized um, tools. Um, the last point is, I said this is uh, the potential. De facto, we are still in a pilot project. This is not a standard. This is just the first zero version, and we have to confess that pillar one and two, uh, occupations and skills and competences, fit well together, while the uh, link to the qualification pillar is still indirect, and that has also to do with different terminologies still in the field of education learning outcomes, in the field of employment skills competences, where work has to be done, so this is not yet a solution for the question you raised. Okay. Now I know that the other three panelists all want to talk about this issue and have something to say, but I just want to get a show of hands amongst the audience. The question here was asked, this is yet another European Union system alongside all the others. Is it too much? How does it link up, etc.? Is that a concern felt by other people in the room? If it is, can I just ask you to raise your hands quickly? So we've got a fair smattering of people. Yes, I would say roughly half the people in this room think this is an issue. Please. Yeah, it's true that during the last decade we, we, we have created a number of tools for good reason, for goodwill, each one, and uh, now I think it's a momentum for thinking about all the tools which are already operational or building, and uh, perhaps to reflect upon about what we call a real uh, European space or European area for skills and qualifications, because we are still far from this, uh, this uh, situation. And uh, we are proposing now at the EU level to, to reflect upon on the simplification of tools, a better integration of tools, and I think ESCO is a good example from this point of view of a good integration of schools. It's not always the case for all the tools. Uh, we, we have to think about that. And to speed up the process. 
because we discussed about, for example, European qualification frameworks for a long time now. I think it's quite urgent when we see youth unemployment in particular to, to speed up the process and thirdly, to be, to be at the level of citizens. Our tools are very often still at the level of systems. Uh, employment services, uh, educational institutions. It's not yet at the level of citizens. Uh, some of them, yes. For example, Europa CV or Eurus CV, uh, we see that. But for the rest, it's still, it's still largely for uh, usual suspects. Uh, so the, the, the next step will be really strategic for, for, for uh, the European Union. Jeremy, you wanted to say something on this very quickly? I mean, very, very briefly, I just want to say that I think um, that the fact that this is a, uh, a multilingual tool is important. The fact that it is um, placing great emphasis on interoperability, so it can be imported, and it will change over time. This is, this is certainly not going to be something that is fixed in concrete. We've, we had a discussion at our last board and it was an inconclusive discussion, but it is something we will have to return to about how we move this forward in the future. When it eventually ceases to be a project, which it will one day, and become a steady state uh, activity, how do we maintain it? How do we continue to prove and reap the benefits that I think ESCO will provide? Last thoughts on this, and then we need to move to another subject. Yeah. Uh, two comments and uh, actually one question back. Uh, the, the first comment would be that the, the need for elaborated um, classification systems like ESCO seems to be undisputed. Uh, the, question, the, the issue however is uh, that in, some, in several member states uh, the development of those of sophisticated tools like this are not really advanced. So ESCO provides a blueprint for a lot of member states to develop this. The second advantage would be, uh, and this is what Jeremy was alluding to, is the interoperability, which in practice means that in case of mobility, two classification systems, uh, randomly selected, if you will, could talk to each other through ESCO. Uh, so you would have a map mapping from uh, a, a country X to a, a country Y without the two negotiating in detail how to, uh, to match. And therefore this provides a lot of productivity and value added at the European level. The question back, if time allows, you are, you are the moderator, would be from those um, isolated voices um, that see a problem uh, maybe... About to, half the audience. Well, I, I didn't see half, but uh, it doesn't matter. But maybe we can get their views why they think this is not a good idea. Well, let's, let's do that. Um, I don't think people were saying it's not a good idea, but I think people were saying, well, it's another classification system. We've heard some very convincing arguments from the panel. For example, ESCO actually creates a blueprint that member states can use to develop their systems. And also that the classification systems can talk to each other through ESCO, so it facilitates what is already out there. Are you convinced? Or are there other issues? Here we go, over here, oh, this is where I get fit. Here we go, running, oh. Um, my name is Tsenkovic Sanya, I come from the Ministry of Labour in Croatia. And just as our colleague from Sweden, we are also in the middle of developing our Croatian qualification framework. And we were expecting inputs from this uh, with a lot of excitement because we do see the need, and this is what we've been doing, in uh, linking our classifications, the uh, occupational classification, uh, qualification, and so on. So we are in the practical process of doing this. So we were very happy to see through the years that this was being developed at a serious level in Europe and how are we going to integrate the ESCO concepts into what we're doing. We see uh, two major issues here. It was one of the reasons why we instituted the Croatian qualification framework, because we saw the skills gaps which are appearing in Croatia. And we wanted to use the qualification framework as a tool to eradicate the possible uh, skills gaps. Um, uh, here, the problem is that the 
educational system does not follow the needs of the labour market efficiently. So the possible problem with this ESCO system is also uh, becoming old-fashioned and not very effective quickly if it's not dynamically updated most of the time. So the, the methods which were used here, are certain experts were put together in reference groups, which is the natural thing to do. But the differences between occupations between countries and even within Croatia, let's say between large and small enterprises, are so large that we have to constantly work on identif identifications of standards which are constantly changing. Very good. Constantly changing standards. Very important issue. Any other issues quickly before we go back to the panel and then we have to move on to another issue after this. Hi, good morning. My name is Roger Tuss from Luxembourg. One question. Shouldn't the ASQ tool have been developed prior to establishing an EQF frame? Thank you. Was the question clear to everyone? Could you just repeat it very quickly and a bit more slowly for the interpreters as well? well I'm talking about the, the, the time uh, issue and the question is if the ASCO tool should not have been developed prior to establishing European quali Qualification Framework. So the link between EQF and ESCO. Any other final questions on this? Right. Please, gentlemen, who wants to answer th those two points that were just made? And then we're going to move on to a different issue. On the last point, um, it's true that we, we, we progressed on the, on the European Qualification Framework before, before ESCO, but also because we have, as I said already, in a number of countries, national qualification frameworks, and it was quite urgent. And uh, it seems that the model of the Euro European Qualification Framework is quite independent, I would say, of the uh, ESCO definition with the eight levels. So, I don't, see, I don't see really a problem. What it is very good now is that in the ESCO project, we didn't reinvent the wheel. And we, we, we have a direct link to a QF portal and to the national qualification frameworks. And to perhaps to answer to the question about uh, the, the fact that it's a moving target, yes, it is. I don't know what will be the labor market needs in the future. And even in the national qualification frameworks, I think in the UK we have more than 25,000 qualifications. So it's not a small, a small business, if I could say. It's, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big uh, uh, issue to update regularly. And I think that every day, every day, you have in countries new qualifications and you have every day obsolete qualifications. And we see new jobs and we see new diplomas. We see every day in a lot of universities. But I think even if it is a challenge, it's also a rational for doing what we expect to do because we have to keep a track of that. Oh, okay, gentlemen, but then we, this is the last thing. I try, to be, move on. I try to be brief, but as a member of the group, I have a personal view on that, which I want to uh, announce here or say here as well. This is really a question of cost-benefit. It can be a never-ending project, ESCO. It can really involve hundreds and thousands of experts in the end if you really cover all European occupations plus the 10,000 of national qualifications in the end. And if the quality is not there for real compar comparability, the added value for the labor market and for the education system, then it was just a project. If it's proving its added value, uh, then it can become a standard. It's so simple. The cost-benefit relation must be there. I think that's a point for every member state that this has to be proven. And we are still at the uh, camp, base camp of Mount Everest with ESCO. Very good. Jeremy, final thoughts? Um, well, just I mean, on that point that, uh, that Croatia has raised, yeah, you set as a challenge because I think it's a perfectly valid point that you make. Um, just as qualifications and standards are changing and will change in the future, so the labour market and jobs change all the time. Um, and there are, you know, the labour market in none of our countries is static. We must stop thinking that it is. There are constantly, uh, in the United Kingdom, changes, uh, definitions are changing all the time. There are jobs being created, there are jobs closing down. Uh, one of the challenges for this even as a project, let alone before it becomes steady state, 
is to, is to keep up with those changes. I think it's a perfectly valid challenge that you've set us. Great. Well, now I have to move on to a new topic. It's come up already, briefly mentioned, which is of labour mobility. And we have a tweet that's asking the question, can this only be used with inside the European Union or can ESCO also help mobility from countries outside of the European Union? And then I have to ask Otto Kazil to stand up. Here we go, who has a very important question to ask. Where is Otto Kazil? There we go. Yeah, my name is Otto Katzil, I'm from Austria, and I have the question if the ISCO system cannot lead to any kind of social dumping. So, for example, that uh, a company in Germany is looking after a, a low-skilled specialist from Bulgaria and pays him only the minimum salary instead of the regular salary. Is there a danger due to ESCO? Servus. Well, there we go. Can we can ESCO reach beyond the borders of the European Union and are we in danger of social dumping? But more importantly, oh, sorry, not more importantly, additionally, how will ESCO actually facilitate mobility? Well, I mean, first of all, um, we already touched upon uh, this issue with the youth unemployment uh, discussion and also the example of mapping the two different systems shows how, the, how the t in technical terms the value added uh, of ESCO would be for mobility because uh, it allows um, cross-border job matching and also move from education to, um, to further education and to further um, and, and to jobs across the border which is not an easy thing to do in Europe because uh, simply of languages. And therefore we have this uh, relatively low mobility. And uh, mobility is definitely not the answer to all the economic problems we have, but it's clearly one underdeveloped element in Europe uh, for two reasons. First of all, we have different uh, labor markets and if there's a skills mismatch or a job uh, and vacancy uh, a mismatch on the one hand and a lot of unemployed uh, people in another area, we should actually try to help people to find a job. So it is not about we don't like people seeing moving, but it's about helping people finding a job in the future. And uh, we support uh, the mobility of young people through Erasmus and other one of the most successful programs uh, the Commission is running. Um, so, uh, this sort of broaden your mind, uh, see beyond your frontier is very important. On the, the question of abuse, um, the question of course is what is abuse in, in, in this sense? But it's clear that um, we, are, we are not in favour of supporting mobility in order to support uh, dumping. So, but we have uh, well-structured uh, uh, European labour market law. Of course, there are always uh, things to, to, imp to be improved. Nothing is perfect. But, uh, and, for instance, recently a couple of uh, incidences in, in Germany shows there were some, let's say, gaps in, in the way um, uh, uh, work contracts could be handed out. And so we are identifying more and more of this. But in principle, uh, when people move from one country to another country, it is from one regular job to another regular job. And it is not the, the, the sort of development of let's try to um, uh, reduce the salaries in, in one country. All the examples currently f that I know from importing uh, countries like UK or Germany um, show that people enter into the regular, into the, in most of the cases, in regular jobs. There are some pockets of problems which we need to identify and, uh, which, and as far as they can be tackled with the application or the development of labor market law, we should do it. 
but blaming ESCO for uh, social dumping uh, would be blaming uh, uh, in your car good brakes that you dare to drive faster. Anyone, anyone else on this issue of mobility and what ESCO can do? Please. Well, I was going to make a very brief point, which is that I suppose the question of uh, you know, accessibility of this to a worldwide global audience, well, we're not going to prevent that. Um, I think you know, um, we've looked at other systems um, in operation internationally uh, in other parts of the world. Um, I think, uh, you know, again... Um, Others may well see the benefits of, of ESCO. We will also learn lessons from other international systems. Just one brief uh, answer to the question of the Austrian colleague. Um, in Germany, for example, there is uh, only a small market for low qualified. We're looking for mid and high qualified uh, people, highly skilled people, so this risk would not come from mobility. But in fact, from the concept of ESCO, I can agree with you that uh, not going only to qualifications anymore, but to smaller packages of skills and competences might also lead to a downgrading of qualification, theoretically. But in the end, this is the res responsibility of the education systems of the governments uh, to prevent that. And in the case of Germany, you always go for full qualification. There is no government responsibility for part qualifications as concerns at least initial training, as in Austria, I think. Thank you. Very good. Pierre, any final thoughts on this, or are you okay? Very good. Well, we have another tweet, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm afraid I can't read the, the at signature, but the question is, what measures are foreseen to ensure the adaptation of ESCO by private sector, job boards, staffing, recruitment, etc.? Is the person who sent that tweet in the room? Did I get that correctly? Would you like to add anything to that? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Jakub Severel from, uh, from TextKernel. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to know um, how many people from the private sector are here in this, in this room? So I think um, that, that, that's uh, more than I uh, feared for, but uh, nonetheless, my question remains, I think, relevant. Um, uh, how do you uh, plan to participate uh, or get to participate the, um, uh, the large staffing agencies, job boards, social networks in this uh, initiative? Because I think uh, governments are uh, facilitators but not the drivers of the labor market. That's the private sector. I get to walk back to the podium slowly so you can think about the answer. <laughs> Who would like to have a go at answering that one? Jeremy. I think uh, I mean, I, I'm encouraged by the number of hands that went up just then. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I probably would like to have seen more, uh, if I'm honest with you. Uh, we do have powerful represent representation on the ESCO board from our good friend Dennis here. Um, and uh, I think you know, they, they, they represent a very very important part of our of our stakeholder community um, so um, you can you can help us in that uh, when, but I think there is a lot of work to do to uh, uh, to, to ensure that uh, this is a shared um, a shared product if you like I don't know whether you'd like to get Dennis to say something because I'm sure he's sitting there itching to say something um, Definitely. Itching, no, 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 no. But I think uh, it's a valid point, and uh, two answers, or at least two, two, two attempts to answer this. The first one would be, as far as employers are concerned, which of course are the, the critical factor in for people finding a job. Uh, hopefully, ESCO will help them to use online uh, search tools and other means to obtain the right candidates and not only from their own country, but because ESCO has this multilingual dimension and cross-border dimension, also from other countries. So this is the first support for, for, for employers. As far as active uh, uh, labor market policy is concerned, there are significant players in the market, public 
uh, private employment services. And as far as uh, cross-border and mobility is concerned, uh, their involvement in what we have as a system, URES, uh, will be increasingly important. So we are already trying to en enhance the, uh, the, the URES system towards private employment service providers. And uh, in, in so far, they will also be customers, but also drivers of ESCO in the future. At least we hope so. Very good. Now, you need to say something on this. And as you're giving us uh, some insights, can you also tackle the question, what was the role of employment services during ESCO's design, which is a tweet that's just come in? Thank you. Um, well, I'm Denis Penel, I'm the Managing Director of EUROSIET, which is the European organization representing private employment services. And as such, I was uh, invited to be a, a board member of ESCO from the beginning. So I can tell you that the private sector was indeed involved into the design of ESCO, and we had quite, uh, or I would not say tense, but uh, real discussion within the ESCO board uh, to make sure that, that the private sector was uh, well taken into account uh, when designing uh, ESCO. And we will still be in future. Uh, uh, again, this is just a visual version of ESCO, so there will be major improvement to come in the future and make sure that from our side we would be very much uh, careful and, and looking very closely about the, uh, the, the new developments of, of ESCO. But representing the, the private employment services, I mean, ESCO is really a great tool for us, uh, especially if we want to promote and to develop cross-border recruitment. Uh, because indeed this is a tool that will help us uh, to post you know, job vacancy in different languages and being able to make sure we use the right terms and definitions when it comes to skills and competencies and qualifications. And this is really important because what we see from really from the field is that more and more indeed companies are not only recruiting on competencies but also well, on skills but also on competencies. So having this, you know, platform this possibility to, uh, uh, what, to translate you know, skills into competencies and also competencies into skills is really essential to us. Uh, because again, qualification is nice, but more and more when we recruit, when we're looking to recruit someone, uh, we need to uh, look at the skills and not only the hard skills, but also the soft skills. This is what is described in ESCO as the, uh, the transversal skills. And this is really essential also to develop mobility, not only from one country to another one, but from one job to another one, from one sector to another one. So again, ESCO is a very useful tool. But of course, what we, uh, I would say, as private development agencies, we are convinced about the, uh, the, 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 the importance of ESCO. And within years yet, within organization, we are promoting ESCO and, and we are promoting the tool. But of course, we also need to convince the user companies, huh? so the, the, the final uh, end users, if I could say. So this is something that remains to, uh, to be done. Uh, and of course, for this, and this is also what the ESCO board is working on, is to develop a real communications plan at the European level to promote ESCO to the citizens, to the EU citizens, but also to the, uh, to the companies, the user companies. But this is still work in progress, but uh, hopefully you will hear from that in the, in the near future. Thank you very much. An important point. Thank you also for raising the question. Um, we're almost to the lunch break, ladies and gentlemen, but before we move there, certainly in Brussels, but I think elsewhere in Europe as well, very often we hear the term Europe 2020. This is a major strategy for us in the European Union. Pierre, how does ESCO relate to Europe 2020, and in what way? Um, you know, Europe 2020, every year, every year, head of states are receiving country recommendations, very often dealing on a number of issues, but very often dealing about employment and the crisis, and very often uh, country-specific recommendations uh, linking education and the issue of the labor market. That's a, the, a, key, a key new way to manage the European uh, society and the European Union. So the, the, the umbrella 
uh, strategy is largely based on that. But in addition, in addition to the country specific recommendations, we have a set of initiatives at the European level for accompanying and helping our member states. And one of those initiatives was the new skills for new job in initiative. And we are in fact implementing what we have launched simply uh, three years ago. And uh, as already mentioned by the Tref, it's a set of initiatives. And one initiative is a scope because we believe that uh, this dialogue, this better understanding between the education field and the labor market is absolutely essential for uh, uh, employment, for education, and at the end of the day for growth and jobs. That's a, the kind of uh, rationale for the link from ESCO, which is a tool which is uh, at the bottom level and the high level strategy. Any comments on this? Or you happy? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're almost at the lunch break. I would like our panelists, quick round, all four of you, if there is one thing you want the audience to take away with them to the lunch break about ESCO, what is it? Jeremy, if we could start with you. You're seeing, this, you're seeing the first fruits of a lot of work today. What you're seeing is the beginning. Um, help us shape it because I believe that ESCO does offer huge opportunities for the future. Thank you very much. Please. Give it a chance. <laughs> very good. Well, try it. try it out and give us feedback. Very good. Pierre, last thoughts from you? Uh, to my friends of the education fe uh, field, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. No fear. No fear. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand to the panelists. Thank you very much.